Hello everyone. The topic of this lecture is hypothesis testing. There are five required data sets for this lecture and you can find them on Canvas. Before we start talking about hypothesis testing, let me illustrate the topic with a simple example. Airlines are very interested in the weight and the weight distribution of their passengers and cargo. Usually, they have a very good idea about the weight of cargo because they can weigh it before it gets loaded onto the plane. But when it comes to the weight of passengers, things get a bit more complicated. Airlines must rely on estimates from various institutions. In Europe, there is the European Aviation Safety Agency, which publishes standard passenger rate, weights. A female passenger is assumed to weigh 146.6 pounds. A male passenger is assumed to weigh 186.5 pounds. And a child under the age of 12 is assumed to weigh 67.7 pounds. In 2017, the Finnish airline Finnair asked passengers to step on a scale before boarding a flight to better understand their payload. Evidence suggested that business class passengers are heavier than passengers in economy. Passengers in, win in the winter are heavier than passengers in the summer due to difference in clothing. Note that when the BBC article was published, by the way, you can find this article by clicking on the link, Finnair had collected data from 180 volunteers. What Finnair did was a hypothesis test. A hypothesis is a statement about a parameter taking on a particular value. If you think back about the Finner example, the hypothesis was that a female passenger weighs 146.6 pounds. That would be formulated as the null hypothesis. A hypothesis test is a procedure to verify the null hypothesis based on a random sample. In the Finnair example, that random sample would have been the 180 passengers. Note that we never accept the null hypothesis, but we fail to reject the null hypothesis. This is very similar to the guilty versus not guilty verdict in courts. We do not have an innocent verdict. The opposite of the null hypothesis is labeled HA, sometimes also H1. In this lecture, we are going to look at various hypothesis tests. The first video focuses on one sample test or also one group test. We are going to look at the population mean with unknown variance and population proportions. Concepts learned from the confidence interval lecture will be helpful. For two sample tests, we have two different samples or two different groups and we compare whether the two groups are similar or different. We are going to look again at population proportions, population means, and we are also going to look at so-called paired difference tests. Note that statistics textbooks often include population mean with known variants. I believe that this is highly unlikely that this is a highly unlikely situation, and we are going to skip this. Now, before I get into the various hypothesis tests, let me illustrate graphically what we are going to do. So, take the Finner example. Here, we are interested in the weight of passengers and we are collecting a sample and let's assume that we are interested in the weight of female passengers. Then our hypothesis H0 would be that the weight of female passengers is equal to 146.6 pounds. The alternative hypothesis is that the weight is different from 146.6 pounds. Okay. Now, think about this the following way. We have our hypothesized value here of 146.6 pounds. And when we collect data, we are going to obtain a distribution of different passenger weights. 
Now, those passenger weights are going to be random. Okay? And it is normal to assume that there will be variation around the mean value. Now, the question is, when we are collecting passenger weights, and suppose we are getting a weight, an average weight of 150 pounds for passengers, then the question is, based on the distribution, how likely is it to get an average weight in our sample of 150 pounds, given that the, that the uh, null hypothesis is that it is 146 pounds? Suppose that the distribution we get from our sample is such that we have 150 pounds here, and this is very far away from the hypothesized value of 146 based on the standard deviation of our distribution. Suppose that it is such that the probability of getting a higher sample of 150, of 150 pounds is just, say, 1%. Okay? What this was, would suggest is that based on our sample of 150 pounds, based on our um, sample mean of 150 pounds, there's only a 1% chance that we are actually getting values above that sample. That would be an indication that the true mean of our female passengers is not going to be 146 pounds. Now compare this with a situation where we have, again, a mean, a hypothesized mean of 146 pounds. We have our distribution. But suppose that the variance of this distribution or of the sample we are getting is such that the 150 pounds our sample mean is right here. Meaning that there's an extremely high chance, say all this area here, and suppose this area is 40%. Here we are in a situation where the 150 pounds is actually not that far off from the 146 pounds, because there is a 40% chance that we would actually find a higher mean sample of 150 pounds. So in the second case, we would have evidence that our null hypothesis of 146.6 pounds is actually correct. Now, throughout the lecture, we are going to make multiple examples, and this concept will become clear. In order to conduct a hypothesis test, you have to follow four steps. The first step is to formulate your hypothesis. The null hypothesis can be either one-sided or two-sided. In a two-sided test, you are interested in whether your parameter deviates in either direction from your hypothesized value. Suppose you are interested in a machine that fills half-gallon containers with milk. A two-sided hypothesis test would test if the fillings deviate in either direction. That is, fills the container with more or less than half a gallon of milk. In a one-sided test, you are interested in deviations in one direction. Think back about the container of milk and the percentage of saturated fat indicated on the nutritional label. Here, it would be important that the actual percentage does, does not exceed the indicated percentage. You would test this with a one-sided test. The second step is to set the significance level called alpha. In general, it is set to 1%, 5%, or 10%. It indicates the probability that you reject the null hypothesis, even if it is true in reality. In a third step, you calculate the test statistic. This is going to be the core of the hypothesis test. Based on the test statistic, you are going to reject or fail to reject the null hypothesis. In order to do so, you have to know what the critical value is.
The critical value represents the point where you either reject or fail to reject H0. The p-value is the probability of observing the parameter given the null hypothesis. Smaller p-values represent evidence against the null hypothesis H0. Note that the equality is always part of the null hypothesis. When conducting a hypothesis test, you can make errors. Now, before getting into the errors, let me talk about when you are actually correct. So think about the null hypothesis, this column here, that in reality, H0 is true or H0 is false. Now, on top here, you have the researcher who fails to reject H0 or rejects H0. In, if in reality H0 is true and you as the researcher based on your data reject H0, then you have made the correct decision. If in reality H0 is false and you as the researcher reject H0, then again you have drawn the right conclusion. Now suppose that H0 in reality is correct, but that you simply have a very bad sample, or a sample that can be considered an outlier. So H0 is true, but you reject H0, then you have conducted a type one error. Note that the significance level of the test alpha is the probability that you're conducting, that you're uh, doing a type one error. A type two error occurs if H0 is actually false and you are failing to reject H0, then you have done a type 2 error. Suppose, think back about the example from FinAir, and suppose that the weight is 146.6 pounds, and that is actually true in reality. Think about this as the value of the population. Now, if you are rejecting H0 in this case, because say you have 150, you have a sample mean of 150 pounds and you're rejecting H0, then you're conducting a type 1 error. The opposite occurs if, in reality, the population weight of passengers is different from 146 pounds, but based on your sample, you are failing to reject the hypothesis, then you would have a type 2 error. Now, before I was talking about the one-sided versus two-sided test. So this is illustrated here. In a two-sided test, you have a hypothesized value and you are interested in deviations to either direction, in either direction. Here, I have drawn a normal distribution and the gray shaded area here represents in total 5%. You have 2.5% on the left side and you have 2.5% on the right side. So in total 5%. If you're doing a one-sided test and you're testing at the 5% significance level, then you only have the 5% either on the left side or on the right side. Now, each statistical software provides a p-value. The p-value is the lowest level of significance at which the null hypothesis can be rejected. The lower the p-value, the more unlikely is your hypothesis, more specifically your null hypothesis. So the null hypothesis H0 is rejected if the p-value is smaller than the significance level. The smaller the p-value, the stronger the evidence against H0 being true. Note that, note that you only have to compare the p-value to your level of significance. If you have set up the hypothesis correctly, and we will see this in R, if the p-value is below your level of significance, then you are rejecting H0. Now we are going to look at one sample or one group hypothesis tests. First, we are going to look at hypothesis tests of the mean 
with unknown variance. If the variance is unknown, or if the population variance is unknown, this requires to use the t-distribution given the following test statistic. We have x bar, which is our sample mean. We have mu, which is our hypothesized mean. We have s as the sample standard deviation. And we have n as the sample size. Note that this entire expression should look very similar to what we have seen for the confidence intervals. Now, suppose that you are the engineer for the local water company and you are concerned about the daily water pressure in the city's pipes. Too much pressure may burst pipes, whereas too little pressure may cause customer complaints. Now, in this case, we are going to conduct a two-sided hypothesis test because we are interested in deviations to either side. Suppose that the regulation requires a water pressure of 50 PSI, or pounds per square inch. You collect a sample of 30 daily water pressures and note that you can find this data set in waterpressure.csv and that the sample mean and the sample standard deviation are 51.78 PSI as the sample mean and the sample standard deviation is 3.389. So following the steps of the hypothesis test, we are first going to formulate the null hypothesis H0 and the alternative hypothesis HA. We have H0 as the water pressure being at 50 psi, and the alternative hypothesis is that it is different from 50 psi. Note that this two-sided test is indicated by the not equal sign. Okay? We are setting the significance level at 5% or the alpha at 0 0.05. Then we have to calculate the test statistic where we have 51.788. This is the sample mean, x bar, minus the hypothesized value, 50, divided by the sample standard deviation, divided by the square root of the sample size. And we get a test statistic of 2.8895. Now, in order to interpret this value, this test statistic, we have to know what the critical value is for our t distribution, where we have 29 degrees of freedom. Note that this critical value for the test statistic is 2.045. Now, let me visualize what's going on here. Let me draw again a T distribution. So this is our T distribution. And note that we have 29 degrees of freedom. Okay. Now, the critical value, since our level of significance is 5%, what we are interested in is, and it is a two-sided hypothesis test, we want to know what is the value here and here that leaves 2.5% in the tails. So here we have 2.5% on the right side, and we have 2.5% on the left side. So it turns out that in our example, the critical value is 2.045. So what this means is the point here is 2.045, and we have negative 2.045 on the left side. 
Now our hypothesized mean, or H0, is that the mean is equal to 50, and with the alternative hypothesis that the mean is different from 50. Now, our test statistic indicates that it is 2.8895. So the test statistic is equal to 2.8895. Now compare the 2.8895, compare it to the critical value. And you see that our test statistic is to the right of our critical value. Suppose that our test statistic is right here. Okay. What this means is that, based on our hypothesized value, it is extremely unlikely to observe the sample mean that we have received. So if the true pressure in the, in the city's water pipes was indeed 50 PSI, based on the sample mean and also the sample uh, standard deviation, it is extremely unlikely to observe the mean of 51.788. Hence, we reject H0, and there is evidence that the water pressure is different from 50 psi. I have already loaded the dataset water pressure. So in the first step, we are going to determine the number of observations. So we type in, as usual, n equals size water pressure comma 1 and we have 30 observations. In the next step for the hypothesis test we are going to calculate the mean. Let's call it x bar and that is the command is mean equals water pressure dot psi and the average water pressure is 51.78. Now the sample standard deviation is equal to STD, water pressure, dot PSI, and the standard deviation is 3.3893. Now let us calculate the test statistic or the t-stat associated with those values. Remember that the null hypothesis is that the mean of the water pressure is equal to 50 psi. So the test statistic is calculated as follows. x bar minus 50 divided by the standard deviation and the standard deviation has to be divided by the square root of n, or the square root of the number of observations. And the test statistic is equal to 2.8895. Now, in order to determine the critical value, okay, remembering that we need to use a t-distribution, we want to know, and since this is a two-sided test, we want to know what is the critical value that leaves 2.5% on the left side and 2.5% on the right side. Now, to get both of those values, note that those values are going to be the same in absolute terms, but they will be a different in sign. You can obtain those values by typing in um, 0 0.025, comma, 0 0.975 comma, and then the degrees of freedom is n minus 1. And you find that the critical value is 2.0452. So what this means is that since the critical value is 
since the test statistic is outside the critical value, we are going to reject the null hypothesis. Now, to calculate the p-value, what we have to do is we have to type in the p-value and then it is 1 minus the cumulative distribution function from the t-distribution at the test statistic that we actually calculated times 2. And hence here the p-value is below the 5% and is valued at 0 0.0072. Now note that this is a very burdensome way to do a hypothesis test. And thankfully MATLAB and most other statistical software packages, they actually have a command built for this. And the command is uh, called t-test. Now note that we are going to use the similar commands that we have used for the confidence intervals, right? Where and for the confidence interval with MATLAB, we were interested in the confidence interval, but now we are actually estimate interested in the other values. And to perform a t-test, we have to type in water pressure or the, the data. And then we have to define the value, uh, sorry, we have to define the, the hypothesized value. Then in our case, that hypothesized value is 50. Note, and we will see this later, that MATLAB assumes that we are doing a two-sided hypothesis test. So when we execute this, we now have the p-value, which is the same as before the point zero zero seven two. We, re we are rejecting the null hypothesis. We are also getting the confidence interval. We are getting to the test statistic. We are getting the degrees of freedom and we are going to get the standard deviation which we have calculated before. So this is how you are doing a two-sided hypothesis test with MATLAB. For the water pressure example, we assume H0, that the mean water pressure is equal to 50. With the alternative hypothesis, that it is not equal to 50. Now, we find that our test statistic is equal to 2.8895 and that the critical value is equal to negative 2.0452 and 2.0452. So we have the so we have here the 2.0452 and we have the two point negative two point zero five four two here. Now what this means is that we have two point five percent in this area. And we have 2.5% in this area. Now, our test statistic, the 2.8895, is here. 2.8895. Meaning it is in the region where we are going to reject H0. 
So this is the two-sided example from the water pressure. Now let us consider a one-sided test. Consider the scores from a graduate MPA class which has 18 students. Note that you can find the data in the file mpa.csv. You will see that the sample mean is 69% or 69 points and the sample standard deviation is 21.15. Note that the sample standard deviation is very large. Now suppose that you are interested in a null hypothesis that the mean scores is actually 80% or more. Note that the bigger or equal sign here represents a one-sided hypothesis. Now, when we are doing the one-sided hypothesis, then we are interested in 5% on one side. So, in this case, we have the following. We have our distribution. And we have a hypothesized mean of 80%. Now here we have H0. is that it's bigger than 80%, bigger than 80. So now we are only interested in deviation to one side. So in this case, we calculate the test statistic as follows. We take the mean that we find, the sample mean minus the hypothesized value divided by the standard deviation, divided by the square root of the sample size, and we get a test statistic of negative 2.2066. So in this case, we have our test statistic, which is negative 2.2066. Now, the question is whether this negative 2.2, whether it falls within the 5% range where we would reject the null hypothesis. And hence, what we need to do is we need to know the critical value. Now, let us see how we can do the one-sided test with the scores that are in the file NPA. Okay, so here you have the scores associated with the, um, with the class performance. Again, in the first step, let's do this manually. We are going to calculate the number of observations, which is the size of the MPA, comma one. And we know already that we have 18 observations. Then we are going to calculate the mean associated with the score. which is equal to 69. And we are going to have calculate the standard deviation. Which is equal to 21.15. And then we are going to calculate the test statistic. Okay, and the test statistic is calculated as before where we say x bar minus the hypothesized mean of 80 divided by the standard deviation, which is divided by the square root of n. And note that we have to do this in parentheses here. And here the test statistic is negative 2.2066. Now to calculate the critical value, we are using again the function TINF, 
a t distribution inverse. And since we are interested in one, one side, we are just typing in the 5% that we have on one side with n minus 1 degrees of freedom. And so the critical value is negative 1.7396. So when we want to calculate the p-value here, we are using again the tcdf at the test statistic with n minus 1 degrees of freedom. And here we see that the p-value is 0 0.0207, which means that we are going to reject the null hypothesis uh, in this case. Now here, note that we are conducting a one-sided test claiming that the score is over 80. So we are doing the t-test, the same function as above. But note now we have to specify that we are actually doing a one-sided test and we do so by not only entering the hypothesized mean, but we also have to say that we are interested only in one tail. And in this case, we are interested in the tail on the left side. And so when you execute this command, then you're getting the following results. Uh, so you have the p-value that we have calculated manually. You are getting also the test statistic, which is negative 2.2066, and you're also getting the degrees of freedom. So again, here we are rejecting the null hypothesis that the MPA scores are over 80. With regard to the MPA scores, we have the null hypothesis that the scores are bigger than 80, with the alternative hypothesis that the scores are smaller than 80, or less than 80. Now, during the calculation, we find the test statistic to be equal to negative 2.2066. And we find that the critical value is equal to negative 1. 1.739. So when you represent this graphically, we have the critical value to be negative 1.7396, which leaves 5% in this area, because this is a one-sided test. Now, our test statistic is negative 2.2066. Our test statistic is negative 2.2066. And hence, we are going to reject the null hypothesis that the scores are bigger than, bigger or equal to 80. Now, note if you want to calculate the p-value, in this case, for the p-value, we have our test statistic of negative 2.2066, and the p-value is equal to 
p-value is equal to 0 0.027. What this means is that this value here, or this area here, represents 2.027%. So if your hypothesis was correct, that the scores are bigger than, bigger or equal to 80, then the probability of finding a more extreme example than, more extreme sample than you have would only be 2.07%. And hence you are rejecting the null hypothesis. Now let us turn our attention to a hypothesis test about a population proportion. Very similar to the confidence interval about a proportion, we can now use the normal distribution instead of the t distribution. This is why I'm going to use the z here. The test statistic for a proportion is taking the average proportion based on your sample minus the hypothesized proportion divided by the standard error. Okay. Now, for this example, we are going to use data from the General Social Survey, GSS, from 2016. In that year, they asked respondent, respondents whether they are using any social media. Out of 1,366 respondents, 30.97% indicated that they are using Instagram. Now, let us calculate two possible hypothesis tests for this example and assume that Instagram claims that one-third of Americans are using their services. So we have the average proportion of 30.97, we have the sample size of 1,366, and under age zero, the proportion is that one-third of the population is using Instagram. So we can calculate the test statistic and we can find that the test statistic is negative 1.8914. Now, if this is a two-sided test, we know that for the standard normal distribution, 1.96 indicates the borders or the cutoff points that leaves one. 2.5% on the left side and 2.5% on the right side of the tail. So if you represent this visually, we have again our distribution, but this time it is actually the normal distribution. Okay, so we have the bell curve and we know that at negative 1.96 and at 1.96 that this leaves 5%, uh, sorry, 2.5% on the left side and 2.5% on the right side. And that we have in here, we have 95%. The advantage of doing a hypothesis test for a proportion is that you do not have to look at the t distribution, and you always know that for a two sided test at the 5% level, that the cutoff points or the critical values are always going to be negative 1.96 and 1.96. Based on the test that we have done, based on the test statistic that we have calculated, we have negative 1.89, meaning that the test statistic is about here. And hence, we are failing to reject the null hypothesis that one third of users are actually using Instagram. If we want to test the null hypothesis that one third of people are using Instagram, then we can use the same command t-test as before. And we type in again 
HPCI, comma, stats equal t test parentheses open social media dot Instagram and you can ask the one third you can simply type in the one third and here you're getting the test statistic or the p-value of 0 0.0588 so if we were to test at the 5% level, we would fail to reject the null hypothesis that one third of the population are using Instagram. Let me visualize this one last time. Suppose that you have a distribution And think about that it doesn't matter about whether this is now a T distribution or a normal distribution. It is valid uh, for both cases. And let us look at a two sided hypothesis test. And for a two sided hypothesis test, you have your critical values, say here. And here, and those critical values leave 2.5% on the right side and 2.5% on the left side. Now, let me shade this with red. And let me shade the 95% in the middle. Let me shade this with green. Now, you have your critical values. Uh, you have them here, and you have them here. Those are the critical values. So, now the important part is if your test statistic is in this area, you reject H0. If your test statistic is in this area, you fail to reject H0, okay? Now keep this picture in mind for everything related to hypothesis testing. Okay. Think about based on your sample, if you get an, an extreme value that is in the tails of the distribution, what this means is that your hypoth hypothesized value is probably not correct. Whereas if you get a sample mean or a sample proportion that is falling in the middle, then there is evidence that your hypothesis is correct. Now in this part of the lecture, we are going to look at two sample or two group hypothesis tests. Basically, what it is, is the following. Suppose you have two samples and you would like to know whether those samples are similar or different. In order to find out whether those samples are different or similar, you have to do a two-group hypothesis test. In this lecture, we are just going to focus on the means of the difference. Now, <clears throat> Consider the following. What we have seen during the last lecture, when we are just looking at one sample, is that, for example, that we are looking at, say, for example, water pressure, where we think about the water pressure being 50 psi. Okay. 
we take a sample and we hypothesize that the water pressure is 50 psi. We take the sample, we calculate the mean, and then we conduct a hypothesis test based on that sample. The two group hypothesis test is slightly different. Suppose you have water pressure from two different cities and you would like to know whether the water pressure in both cities is identical. Hence, you would conduct a two-group hypothesis test where your null hypothesis would be that, say, the water pressure in city one is equal to the water pressure in city two. Okay? And the alternative hypothesis would be that the water pressure in city one is different than the water pressure in city two. Now, when we compare means between two different groups, there's a slight difference compared to the one group hypothesis test, in the sense that we have to know something about the distribution of the water pressure in the first city and the water pressure in the second city. In one type of hypothesis test, we can assume that both water pressures, or the variance of both water pressures in both cities is equal. So that the variance in city one is equal to the variance in city two. Note that this refers to the population variance. Or in this case, it's actually the standard deviation. So this is what I have indicated with those two graphs. So we have city one here, and we have city two here. And when we assume that the standard deviation is the same in both cities, then the distribution around the mean is identical, or we assume that it is identical. However, it could also be the case that for some reason, we think that the population variance in city one, or the standard deviation in city one, is different than the standard deviation in city two. And again, this refers to the population variance or population uh, standard deviation. Okay. Now, this is what I have illustrated here in the bottom graph, where for city one, the variance is very small. This is indicated that the mass of the distribution is around mu one, whereas in city two, there is a much larger variance. Okay. So here we would have that the variance or the standard deviation in city one is smaller than the standard deviation in city two. Okay. Now we will see that when we implement this in R, that the difference is going to be very small in terms of p-value, but it is still something to keep in mind. So what we are going to see in this lecture is, again, we are looking at a hypothesis test on the difference between two means. And in the first case, we are going to assume that the variance between the two means is equal. This could be, for example, if you have a pretest and a post-test on a particular population. Now, the advantage of assuming that the variance between the two means is equal, or the, between the two populations is equal, is that you only have to estimate one variance. Okay? Now, if you think that the means of the two populations are independent, or that the variance is independent, then you actually have to estimate two means. This is what you see here. Okay? Now, the next couple of slides are going to be technical, but do not worry about it too much since we are going to implement this in R and it's going to be much easier. So in the first case, when we actually assume that we have two populations with equal variance, then we only have to estimate one variance. This is what, what is indicated in the top line here, where we are 
estimating what is called the pooled variance. Think about this as the average value between the sample variance uh, of group 1 and the sample variance of group 2. Then, very much like before, we have a test statistic and we will see that we compare this test statistic to a critical value. In the case where we have unequal population variance between the two groups, then we are still going to calculate a test statistic, but we do not have a pooled variance. Okay? Also note that the degrees of freedom are going to be calculated slightly different. And we will see that the degrees of freedom are not going to be an, uh, an integer number anymore. Before we test the hypothesis that the scores of schools from small schools or large schools is the same, in Ohio we first have to prepare our data. Note that the Ohio data set contains the score of the school, the enrollment, and the median income. And our hypothesis is that small schools with less than a thousand student uh, enrollment perform as well as large schools with more than 3,000 students. In the first step, we have to separate out the schools based on size. So let's call it Ohio Small. And those are all the schools with less than 1,000 student enrollment. So this is Ohio, then Ohio dot enrollment with less than a thousand and we are selecting all uh, columns and then we are also looking at the large schools. So here for large schools we are considering more than 3,000 students And when we evaluate those two statements, we see that there are 138 large schools and 161 small school districts, actually. To implement a two-sample hypothesis test in MATLAB, we have to use the command ttest2. Okay. So we have to say ttest2. And then we say Ohio small scores, comma, Ohio large scores. And note by default, MATLAB is assuming an equal variance. When we evaluate this, uh, and it is score, not scores. And what we see is that the p-value is at 0.1086, meaning that if even if we were to test up to the 10% level, we would still fail to reject the null hypothesis. Okay. So here there is evidence that there is no difference in performance. Now, if you are assuming unequal variance, then you have to tell MATLAB explicitly. And specifically, you have to type raw type, comma, unequal. When you evaluate this, you see that the p-value has slightly changed. Now here the p-value is now at 11.83%, and hence, again, you are failing to reject the null hypothesis that there is no difference in school performance. For the paired hypothesis test, let us first look at the values for the online, school, online bookstore and the regular bookstore. Now, 
Note that we have five observations in each data set and that they are paired in the sense that the book that costs 1020 here is the same book that costs 1140 here. The 1895 book is the same as the $19 book and so on. Note that if you compare this to the Ohio school enrollment, the school district which is in the less than 1,000 students is not going to be in the school district with more than 3,000 students. So there is no, so the unit of analysis is only in one of the two groups. Whereas here, our unit of analysis is a particular book and the price of that book is in two different groups. Now to do the hypothesis test with the paired sample, we have to use again the function t-test, but without the two because if we are entering two data series here, then MATLAB by default is going to assume that we are talking about a paired hypothesis test. Now remember that at some point I mentioned that it is extremely important to read the documentation and default values associated with MATLAB. Now this is a very good example here that if you had two samples that are not paired, by default, using the function t-test, by default, MATLAB would assume that they are paired. If they're not paired, that's the reason why you have to use the t-test tool. Now, if you are evaluating this statement, what you can find is that the p-value is at 0.1062 which means that you fail to reject the null hypothesis that the means in a, that the mean in price between the online store and the uh, regular store is uh, is the same or so you're failing to reject so there's evidence that the prices are identical in both stores